question? So, um, no, <laughs> no, about your presentation. Um, I learned a lot. Um, thank you so much. Um, there was a part that you mentioned um, about uh, tangible assets and intangible assets. I think the intangible was the spiritual gifts, the time, the talents. So, um, as a youth ministries here at Madoc, um, what can we do um, to help foster growth or um, allowing younger children or youth in our church to be, or to develop those tangible, intangible assets, if that makes any sense. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So the question is, is that what sort of a program or what sort of tools or resources can you, you um, utilize in helping the young people in the church to um, utilize their talents, their, um, the, the spiritual gifts, the time. Okay, it comes down to working with parents, okay? One of the things parents have to do is always design little programs for your kids. So for example, if you're doing something in the church, always do something that is what I call thematic, not just randomly select. So for example, let's say you wanted to study a subject like the Sabbath, for example. So you want to make the Sabbath understood to your kids from a point that is a delight to them, a joy. When I was growing up as a kid, when I was small, the Sabbath was a yoke. It was such a bad yoke, my granduncle was living right next door to us, and he used to come over every Friday night and sing these songs. And one of the songs he sang was from Greenland, Icy Mountain. So how do, how do you live in, in Grenada? It's so hot you could figure out where Greenland is and how cold it is. So, so the point I'm trying to make to you, so what you're going to do is Get a, <laughs> get a thematic topic. So let's say you want to study the Sabbath, or even doing the, um, the, um, the history of the church. This is really, really good. So what you're going to do is, uh, on, a, on a half a piece of paper like this, okay, you're going to write out a little project that they're going to be doing at home with the parents. So you want the parents to be involved. Because what is going to drive it is the parents' um, willingness to help you. If you're on your own, mm -hmm. you're dead meat, sorry, okay? Mm -hmm. So you want them to help. So what you do, in all of my training, I, and I can send you some stuff, I always make up these little things with action items to it. You understand? Mm -hmm. So for example, if you're gonna be teaching the history of the church, you know, you can ask a couple of questions. Who was Ellen G. White? Where was she born, when? So that's a research for them to do. So the parents have to help them with it. You follow me? Now when they all come into the church now, you're gonna sit down and you're going to review what the collection of information that they have. So you, to get the kids involved, the parents must be involved. By yourself, no. Even if the kids are as big as you. I mean it in a good way. Try to get the parents involved. Does that make sense? Okay. Somebody else had a question? Oh, I, what about, what about um, helping them to identify their spiritual gifts? Okay, helping them to identify their spiritual gifts. One of the things that parents should do, and after, um, I didn't understand it until I became an adult. Um, we have winters and summers and all this kind of stuff out here. One of the things that parents must do is engage the kids in cleaning the snow, in helping them in the garden during the course of the week. In trying to talk, so for example, I know families get engaged in um, um, outreach. You take your son or your daughter with you. I had an acquaintance, his name was um, Kevin, and he was a Jehovah Witness. And so whenever he went knocking on doors, he always brought his daughter Tansy along with him. Along with him. And so I said to Kevin one, I said, Kevin, you know, you're taking your daughter along with you. Does it help? He says, you won't believe how many people curse my daughter and curse me to get her, get her from the front of the door. What do you think was happening to that child? What do you think was happening to that child? Huh? I guess she would be turned off yeah. the child. Because she doesn't fully understand. Why do you think people who become Jehovah Witnesses never leave the church? Or most of them don't. Training. One of the things Jehovah Witnesses have learned to do is to endure the cursing, the swearing. So every time it happens to Tansy, Kevin is talking to her. 
encouraging her. And do you know, I, d I don't like doing door-to-door, -door, I'll be very honest with you. But I did, it doesn't care, it's brainwashing. But it is effective, it's working. And so as we go out to do evangelism, take our kids with us. And too much of our evangelism is in f distributing flyers. The most ineffective form of evangelism. If we can go out and make friends and then invite friends, the church is going to grow a lot faster. So in terms of getting your kids involved, projects, but if we can get out some more. Oh, I know I, I was doing. We were doing some door knock in California. And man, some people could be mean and ugly. But do you know what? And Kevin said so to me. This is your witness. He says, Glendon, I would knock on 99 doors, and people would curse and swear and slam doors in my face. But the 100th door, this person who wants to study the Bible with me, he says, I forget everything of what happened in the 99 doors. It's training. Yeah, let me ask you a question. How many people readily accepted Christ? Exactly. And what is he doing? Performing great miracles. You remember the story? He had, I think he had fed the 4,000. John chapter 5. John chapter 6, next day they came looking for more food. And Jesus said to them, Un unless you eat of this flesh and drink of this blood, <laughs> you have no life. What did they do? They went away. They went away. This is, they came looking for the food. So the point I'm trying to make to you is if Christ, who had performed that type of miracles, that many miracles, could be rejected by the people he came to save, who am I? Who am I? Does that make sense? Yes? yes? Um, can you explain spiritual gifts? Okay, a spiritual gift is something you engage in or you have. So, so my spiritual gift is studying the Bible. I know that. Because I'm always searching, looking, reading the Bible, reading Ellen G. White, looking for something new. So, that, so how I discovered it, I'll tell you how I discovered it. So I was in the church, and the church was very unfriendly. I absolutely didn't know what to do, where to go. I'm new to this church. And basically, I just walked in on a Sabbath and walked it on a Sabbath. But God had allowed a circumstance to come into my life. I could not leave the church. And so I'm sitting in the church that afternoon, the back of the church there, and they had about a half a dozen people, look, they're all dying already, talking about prison ministry. And I'm sitting in the back of the church there, and nobody came and says, what's your name? Would you like to come and join? I sat in the back there, and the worst part of the lights were turned on. They could not have missed me. So when it was finished, I went and says, what is this? They says, well, it's a prison ministry. I said, could I join? I didn't even know that. I never even asked, you know, do I have to go to jail or anything? They just said prison ministry. I said, could I join? They said, yes. No training, no nothing. So they told me that I had to go to prison, and it was a jail. So what did I do? I have to go do Bible studies. What would you do? You're young in the church, you're brand new, you know nothing in the Bible? I picked up some lesson guides. Start there. So I went down there, so I would study the lesson guides, and I'm learning, and I'm gonna go down there, and I'm gonna meet the prisoners, and we're gonna rap, and we're gonna study, and then all of a sudden, I wanna go to another prison. And then I was going to the Lindsay Jail. And I, every Sabbath, man, I had a, every Sabbath I went to Lindsay Jail, I had a congregation, four times. We were four sessions, okay? And I would have the first one, 18 or 16 or 15. By the end of a Sabbath going to Lindsay Prison, I would have spoken to 15, 30, 40, almost 50 inmates. And one evening, it was winter time. It was so cold out. And it was so snowy. And what happened is, I came out of the prison, and it was foggy. And I go, my goodness. 
So I got onto the main road, Highway 35, to come south. It was so foggy, I was scared. I found myself at home having supper. When I left the prison at four, it is now some minutes after five. An angel took me, totally erased from my memory, how I got from Lindsay to my house in Oshawa. I sat at the table church. I sat at the table and I'm trying to rehearse in my mind where did the, 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 the fog stop. I cannot remember any of the landmarks I should have seen as I came along the road. I couldn't remember Highway um, Taunton Road. I was sitting having a meal. When you go for God, I can tell you some experiences. I, I shared Brother Vaughn one. I, I did some foolish stuff back in January. The ice rain. But you know that night? I did a Bible study for two plus something hours in Trenton. And the people begged us, Marie and I, to stay overnight. I said, no, we're going home. It was two pastors, Sunday pastors, and another woman. We studied Daniel chapter 2. And a 35, 40 minute drive to my house took two hours that night. And the only how we made it, the, the vehicle could not get above 10 kilometers. It would just slide along the ice like that. It was not the smartest thing for me to do, I'll be honest. We, have, you know, we don't just try to impose on the grace of God. But even in my foolishness, God intervened. So it's when you stretch for God, God is going to help you along the way. And you're going to see miracles in your life. Literal miracles. People come into a knowledge of the truth. People getting baptized into the church. I heard of a group of people that wanted to study the Bible. And God was so good. Some of them were in New York, Trinidad, Florida, Grenada. So when I was told about it, I thought about it. And a guy said, you know, a woman who knew someone who could have gotten us a conference line. We got a conference line for free. Every Saturday night, I made sure I was at my house by 8 o'clock. I can't remember how many weeks we studied the book of Daniel on a conference line. People I have not seen, some people I was familiar with as a kid growing up. So coming back to your spiritual gifts, when you find yourself engaged in the work of the Lord, there are some women that are really good at looking after the kitchen. There are some people that are very good helping, coming with visitors into the church. A survey cannot give you that. Why? Because it is a spiritual gift. It is something that the Holy Spirit enables you to do. And then you find yourself pushing yourself to do more. And it is all the work of the Lord. And there are many people I've seen in the church with great spiritual gifts. And if you were to ask them about it, they would say to you, oh, I just enjoy doing it. I just like to make people happy. It fits very well with what I'm doing. It's the, you remember? The gift of the Spirit. So it's going to be guided by the Spirit it will be molded by the Spirit, and you're going to walk in the Spirit with it. So because I feel that God has blessed me with that gift, everywhere I hear of somebody who wants a Bible study, I'm first in line. Whether it's by phone, I have a teleconference line now that I use, or I go to see them and do the Bible study. So, just, so you have to get en engaged in the work. You understand what I'm trying to say to you? You have to be engaged in the work. So look for opportunities. Um, there is a presentation. I'll come and do it one afternoon at MV. I'm volunteering myself here. Okay. And it's, um, I'll teach you. I'll teach you how to do witnessing. Mm -hmm. And you know what? You see my wife, Marie, who knows her? She's a better witness than I am. You'll be amazed to know Marie is a better witness than I am. Mm -hmm. Because my spiritual gift is 
Bible studies. So I'm looking for Bible studies. Whereas Marie is good. You ask Marie what she has in her bag. She has a little book. She's got a little, um, uh, how do you call it, glow trap. She's putting them all over the place. And so we were in, in 2015, we were, tra we were traveling to um, Texas. So we stopped at a motel for the night. We slept. And in the morning, we, we were leaving. So I went back and I checked the room um, to see if we had taken everything. So as I looked at one of the night tables, I saw a Seventh-day Adventist <laughs> bulletin. <laughs> Kenwood Seventh-day Adventist Church bulletin. So I went and I said, Marie, did you leave that in there? She said, yes. I said, that is Kenwood Seventh-day Adventist Church. She says, you don't understand that. Somebody, the maid of somebody that can come in there, it may strike a chord in them. You don't know. I said, that is witnessing. I would take a stack of materials to God. It would take me years before I get worn out. But during that time period, I get Bible studies. She does not care about doing Bible studies. She just cares about getting the literature out. Go ahead, Sister. So literature distribution is also a gift. It's also a gift, absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. It's not that everybody has the gift to give a Bible. That's correct. That's the point. And everything working together. Exactly. And, you know, that's what makes the church to grow. Yeah, church. And, and one of the things we focus on too much is the, lo the local growth of the church. The church is worldwide. Wherever you find a person, wherever they are, in any part of the world, and you can reach out to them, reach out to them. I answer questions online for Amazing Facts. And every Friday night, not every, most Friday nights, I sit down and answer questions. And so I'm reaching out to so many people from around the world. I don't know what part. I know they're from Arizona, or they're from China, or they're from India, or they're from some. I don't know what the circumstances are. I just enjoy doing it. So that's the point I'm trying to make, is that once you enjoy doing it, like Marie loves giving out stuff. So she goes downstairs and she packs it. You want this book? No, you want this book? You want this book? And she gets it out. So that's the point I'm trying to make to you. You know, I, I met a gentleman who picked up a flyer on a train in Toronto, and it was a seven day adventure six weeks afterwards. Amen. Amen. He had no interest in God, he had no interest in prophecy, but the thing was so colorful, the mark of the beast, he figured he should go learn about the mark of the beast. So before he gets the mark of the beast, he joined the church. <laughs> Okay, this is how it works, in my experience. Don't think of a spiritual gift as God has given you this one spiritual gift. He has given us many gifts. Okay, so I'll give you an example. I'm going to use myself as an example. I would be home. It's 10 o'clock in the night. And somebody has a problem. Mississauga. I leave my house in Walkworth and drive to Mississauga to help that person. I just like helping people. Now, I learned that from my father growing up. My father was very kind to just about everybody he met. So the point I'm trying to make to you, don't try to isolate it. I don't know if it's a spiritual gift or not, but don't try to isolate it to one thing. I see you got some young kids there. So that's a spiritual gift. You're bringing up some young kids. See, you're providing care for them. You're taking care of them. So as much as you have a love in your heart for kids, but you are trying to bring them up in the way of the Lord. So it's a, it's a talent, number one, but there's the gift of teaching. You see, the church tries to find somehow if the, the focus in the church is misguided. The focus in the church is that if you can speak well and teach well and preach well, you're going to get somewhere. But that's not what it is. You have to look and see how people are building up for the kingdom of God. So when you take a look at the parent, you take a look at a parent that have two or three kids, what am I doing as a member of the church to possibly provide them some help along the way? You see, we are too much individuals. We have to see people in the church. Hey, Sister Carlene. I love to joke with Sister Carlene. The minute she sees me, she starts smiling. I say, yeah, good. 
But that's not a spiritual gift. But the point I'm trying to make <laughs> to you. <laughs> What's your name, sorry? Heather. Heather. Pleased to meet you, Heather. Hi, pleased to meet you. How many people have you walked into the church? Whenever I get to church in the morning, early, I see people walking into church quarter past 9, 9.30. Do you know the very first thing you should do when you walk into the church on a Sabbath morning is to greet everybody in the church? The point I'm making, if we get into church at 10, 10 then it's, you're late. The reason Sabbath school is dead as it is right now, everybody's late. And so, it, so Sabbath school has dwindled out now where people show up, it's like stopping at Tim Hortons for a coffee. I better show up to church and get a quick fix during the divine hour and go home. There is no relationship building in the church. You should be the first person in the church and the last person to live after the divine hour. I'll tell you a true story here. Go ahead. Amen. Get to church early. Get to church 9 o'clock, 5 to 9. Get to church in time. I went to a church one Sabbath morning. I told you I was going to speak until 20 to 8. <laughs> and as I walked through the church, the lady said to me, Brother Glenn, you can go downstairs and have yourself a donut and coffee. To get people coming to Sabbath school, you got to give them donut and coffee. I hope the I hope the fire from heaven would just consume it all. <laughs> but the point I'm trying to make to you, we have lost the spirituality in too many lives. And what has happened? Jessica spoke about it. You don't hear the Seventh Adventist message that makes us a distinct people any longer. And so when I looked at the quarterly this, this week, I went, what? End time? I'm not going to tell you. I want you to find it out yourself. Stud, that's the point. You can study. No, if you, I, I didn't read the whole quarterly. I didn't read the whole quarterly. What I'm trying to tell you. What I'm trying to tell you. Only those who are diligent students of the Scripture, with the love of God in their heart will be shielded from the great delusion that is taking the world captive. Taking the church captive. Taking the church captive. So, we practice something called home church. So last week we had home church. So for home church, is Bible study. So we studied the 70 week prophecy. You went over to a family's home. So we, we shift around houses. We studied the 70 week prophecy from about, between 10, 30, quarter to 11 to about 20 after 1. We had lunch. Then we went back at it again, somewhere about 2.30, quarter to 3, and we finished at 20 after 6. Church, I can't get that in the church. And what the Lord has shown us as we studied that 70-week prophecy is out of this world. 
that church would only grow when we have... Why, why is the Jehovah Witnesses Church growing? Why? They, have, they believe that Jesus is not God. Yet, look at... The, people take this seriously, church. They have a conviction of their message. They are so convinced that they are willing to give up everything in this life. Just for the church. And that's where we have to come to. We must be willing to look at conditions and say, you know what? This isn't right. There are many churches that don't let me come into their church any longer. I preach three angels' message. And I tell people straight out, look, you don't change, you don't reform. This is not acceptable to God. But Glendon, that is why God is not bringing a lot of people in, in our church today. Yes, but the... Because we are not preaching the straight truth that should be in the preach. In preach. Even in white setting, yeah. she said, the Lord does not now work to mm -hmm. bring many in. And she tells what? Because of the unconsecrated members. Of the church. And until the church becomes consecrated to Jesus Christ, you're not going to see people flooding into the church. Do you know in the United States right now, there are a large number of evangelicals that are going to come into the Seventh-day Adventist church? Hmm. How do I know that? They're asking the questions, why are our ministers going to Rome? Evangelicals, they want to know why th the ministers are going. So where are they going to go to if we don't have the truth to give to them? That's right. You understand? You were going to say something, sister. Yes, I was going to um, agree with Sister Mary, but I'm also going to say that a lot of the other denominations are growing because since it is not so much after them, it's after our people. Exactly. It's all about the individual connectedness with Christ. When we connect individually with Christ, we grow, and we're able to share that light, we're able to, to share. Yeah, so remember that lady Monica who is the teacher? It was the Spirit of God that moved. Why? She loves to teach. So when I taught her the plan of salvation, she was able, I never thought of it at the time. She was able to grasp it. So when she goes out witnessing, what do you think she's doing? She's teaching, exactly. Now I used to teach. So two of us were able to relate. So the point I'm trying to make to you is not every time you do it, you might be successful. You're going to mess up. You're going to make mistakes. But remember, Paul says, I planted, or cinnamon watered. But who gave the increase? God gave the increase. So all God wants us to do is go and tell, and he's going to bring the people in. Yeah, it is. But what I want to leave with you is this is a beautiful message. There is no other message than this. When you can explain the 70 week prophecy, I was teaching it at the, um, the Bible study I did in, um, um, in, in uh, Trenton. And so there was a lady there, and um, that is Candace. And Candace believed, you see, the, the guy by the name of Raj that sat next to her, he had written a book on Bible prophecy. So Candace had believed that that 70th week is at the far end. So when I studied it, and I showed how Christ fulfilled it, she says, that makes sense to me. Amen. Amen. Understand that prophecy. And do you know what was in that prophecy the Lord showed me? That's when I come back the next time. Here's Jessica. Yes. Yes. Why not? I was just going to say, let me not say it is not possible. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Okay. It's, it's, it's a, it would be a challenge. You, you, remember, a challenge. you remember I told you about the lady from Grass Valley, okay. California? Yeah, but before you go there, I'm not sure if somebody would want to come to drive one hour. 
Because we all sit down and trying to figure out the work for the Lord. Grass Valley is located all farms around you. Everybody lives a great distance away. So when I had to go to Grass Valley, it took us almost about an hour to go there, to Grass Valley. Now Grass Valley has potlucks every Sabbath. But this woman, what did she do? She had a ministry. She did not think about the potluck that the visitor may want to go to. She didn't think about the potluck that possibly the, the, the couple that's trying to break up would want to go to. My ministry is to serve the Lord. So she just go and invite them. So that was her ministry. That's the point I'm trying to make to you. Don't sit down and try to figure out why, where. I'll tell you what, you, you are not in the world. So let me tell you about the world. So with the world, this is how you, you operate. I live in Walkworth. And someone in Osho invite me to a party. And it is 20 below outside, I'm going. I learned from the world. So never ask any person. We had, I remember, I went to a church and we were invited to lunch. Man, the distance we had to travel to this lunch. It was a, oh, actually I was doing a series of meetings in Woodbridge, that's right. And this lady invited us to church, to her lunch, to lunch in Mississauga, my wife and I. It was a good distance. But the food was so good, I didn't think of the distance to go back. But you know what? They became like friends to us. So don't put up the barriers. Pray in your heart, Lord, who can I invite to lunch today? So for example, you happen to know Wilmar? There's nothing to invite, nothing wrong to invite Wilmar. Wilmar come over to our house for lunch today. Well, I could always say yes or no. What you want to do is to find people and find where they're itching, where they're hurting. Can I help you? You see, I'm not trying to beat up on the church and potluck or nothing. But we have to find a way to reach to the hearts and minds of people. People come into the church and they're looking good and they dress good. They're dying inside of them. Circumstances are wrong them in the house and in the family and stuff like that. You get a chance to pray with people. And Glenda, is not everyone in the church will have the same ministry. Right? Exactly. So one person in the year might see visitors coming and say, come on with me. And the others might not be impressed to do that. This, I, I, a guy told me a story. A gentleman told me a story. In the are, instead of a whole church doing the same thing, Thing. No, listen to me. Reach out to people. Reach? Just reach out to people. Number one, come to church early. Do you know the number of people? I walked into College Park Church and I used to get there early. And I would go down the pews and shake people's hands. Sister, good morning, good afternoon. So what happened? I picked up the bulletin. And um, so Marie and I had a ministry that we, the church used to have at the back of it all of the shut-ins. So Marie and I said, you know what, an easy way to do ministry in the summer is to just call these people of the shut-ins and says, could we come and visit? So that Sabbath afternoon, we called up. And this, the gentleman, the husband, was dying of cancer. I, I knew that because I heard it in the church. So when I called, the wife said, let me talk to him. So she came back and she said, that he cannot take a visit right now. He's on morphine, and he's pretty drugged up. He's sleeping. That was Saturday. Two Sundays later, I went to an event in the church. So we sat downstairs in the fellowship hall, and a gentleman looked at me and says, you Glendon Robinson? I said, yes. He says, who are you? What kind of question is that? He says, did you call someone last Sabbath? That's two Sabbaths ago. I said, yes. He said, that's a very, very good friend of mine. And she's going to come to the church and give a testimony. I said, what happened? When I called her, and I prayed with her, just before I called her, she was contemplating suicide. That prayer saved her life. Witnessing is not hard. All 
we have to do is reach out to people. Reach out to people. I, the, I, Marie and I, we're very different people. And she likes one type of witnessing, I like another. But I will support her in what she does, and she supports me in what she does, and in, in what I do. So the point I'm trying to make to you, we can put up all kinds of barriers in our lives. All kinds of barriers. I knew a brother. I knew a brother who was falling away from the church. And this guy got so mad at me one day. So anyhow, Marie said, this isn't very good. I said, okay, that's fine. I was kind to that guy. I was calling him up. I would talk with him. And every time I call him up, he's beating up on me, you know, and I just tolerated and tolerated it. Just recently, him and I had such a beautiful conversation about the church. We had such a beautiful conversation about the role of the church. He is now going back 180 degrees. I could have discarded him and said, listen, I don't have time for you. But I valued him as a friend. I said, you know what, whatever came into him, I don't know. So what the point I'm trying to make to you, as I did it, when I started, I was scared. But then I started doing it, and I started doing it, I started doing it. I've been doing prison ministry now for, um, I don't know, 12, 14 years. I, walk, I go to Walkworth Prison now. I've been going there 12 years, uh, since 2012. The inmates are begging me, study the Antichrist. Study the Antichrist. That's not an easy subject to teach. They ask me about hellfire. We studied the little horn of Daniel chapter 7. I see how, the, how God is working. I said, man, this is awesome. I've never been able to do that in a prison or a jail before. Why? The Spirit of God is working. So the point I'm trying to make to you, whoever you are, you got a phone, you got an email, encourage a person. Invite a person to a lunch. Or just get up one afternoon in the summertime. Could we come by and visit with you? Have a prayer with you. And you're going to see a difference in your life. And then you're going to discover your spiritual gift. You've got to put it to use. And have the Spirit guide you. But I want to remind you. You belong to the remnant. We are the remnant. And as you study this lesson quarterly, find the error for me, please. Because I want to quiz in Mr. Vaughan every week. <laughs> so, I've got myself a bullhorn. Vaughan! <laughs> Sorry. I never used to laugh. I never used to laugh. I grew up as a kid. Very serious. But you know what? I'm honest about it. I never used to laugh. I was a very um, shy person. I was, uh, but you know, since I found the Lord, well, I didn't find the Lord. The Lord found me. Mm -hmm. Absolutely true. I didn't go looking for God. I didn't go to no religion, anything. God took me from where I was. And I tell you, um, when it came to discover the seven in this message, it's an awesome message. It's an awesome message. Do you know, do you know, one more talk to me. Yeah, that's fine. Do you know when God gave, when, when, when Daniel received the 2300 day prophecy, okay? When he received the 2300 day prophecy, what were the two main events to take place in the plan of salvation? You got half of the question right. You know what it was? Now we can come to understand why energy white should be so valued in the church. Because Christ was coming, so God had to raise up a prophet to prepare the way of Christ, to prepare people for the way of Christ. For Christ to fulfill the plan of salvation, 
in the first part of the earthly century. You with me? So Christ was the Passover lamb. Christ was, Christ was the offering of first fruits. Christ was the um, Feast of Unleavened Bread. He, he was on the Sabbath. So the first part of the century in the plan of salvation, God had to prepare a people for that part of Christ's ministry in the plan of salvation. You understand what I'm saying? So both energy wines, John the Baptist and Daniel are linked to the century. You with me? Mm -hmm. Daniel with the prophecy in the century. John the Baptist prepared uh, a people for the coming of Jesus Christ to carry the plan of salvation in the earthly century, which was then transfer, tra transitioned to the heavenly century, which means that God raised up L.A.G. White for what reason? To prepare a people for what? The second coming of Jesus Christ as he completes the plan of salvation in the heavenly century. When I saw that, I go, my goodness. It is a beautiful message. So get out there and tell people. Amen? Amen. 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 Thanks, man. Let's have a prayer. Happy Father, what an awesome God you are. We cannot fathom the height and depth of your love. The width of your love, dear God, because you are love. God is love. Father, when we come before your throne of grace, Father, there is nothing good in us that we can count. But we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who paid for our sins on the cross of Calvary. By that death, he has reconciled us back to you. By that death, dear God, Father, we can now receive the forgiveness of our sins, repentance of our sins. We can stand justified before you. Father, we can experience sanctification in our lives. Father, we can find, experience the infilling of the Holy Spirit in our lives, that we can be sons and daughters of God. So we thank you, dear God. And Father, I pray that we would lift up our hearts to you, our whole minds, our entire being, dear God. Heavenly Father, that your spirit can work in us and be the people that you want us to be. Father, to lift up Christ in this sin-cursed earth. Heavenly Father, that men and women who are lost can see him and be drawn to him. Father, we want to thank you for bringing us into this wonderful message, this wonderful church. Father, you have given us your Bible and the spirit of prophecy. And Heavenly Father, I pray that both are going to be in our lives, Heavenly Father, from now to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I thank you for our church, the congregation that assembles here. Thank you for the men and women who participate, who lead out in this church. But Father, I pray that that love that they have for each other is going to be multiplied, is going to be magnified, Heavenly Father, on a very personal level. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, when we look around this, Father, we see the signs of, of the second coming of Jesus Christ. It is clearer than ever before in our eyes. So Father, I just pray, Father, that we're going to be humble. We're going to submit ourselves to the chastening and the chafing. Heavenly Father, that we can be a people, dear God, with the characters that have been reformed. Father, we could be revived. Heavenly Father, in, in, in our lives, that we can take this message wherever we find ourselves, at any place during the course of the day. So Father, we just want to thank you. We want to thank you, Heavenly Father, for the great promises that you have laid up for us. But Jesus says, well, I will come again. Heavenly Father, it is the day that we are looking forward to. I pray to God that none would ever be disappointed. So Father, we, I just pray that we continue to work, Father, while it is still day. For the night is coming when no man can work. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, as we look around us, Father, we see so many issues, so many problems. But Father, they are not our problems. They are your problems to deal with. So keep our eyes fixed upon the prize. Father, let us not look back to where we have come from. Father, let us not look for alternate routes, different options, different choices, but know that thus said the word of the Lord. Heavenly Father, that if we dwell on your word, Heavenly Father, if the spirit of prophecy is a part of our lives, Father, we're going to have the knowledge, Father, that we can share the understanding, dear God, that we can explain things, and the wisdom to discern, Father, how we disseminate this message. So I thank you, dear God, for the young people of this church, this, this, this group, dear God, Heavenly Father, I just pray that the angels look over them. Heavenly Father, I just pray that you can fill the Spirit of God in them. Father, I just pray that they would grow up to be soldiers in the army for the Lord. Heavenly Father, because everyone is called to the work at this time. None is exempt. And Father, I pray that when all is said and done, that the times that we would have spent distributing books, the time we would have spent conducting seminars, the time we would have spent on the health ministry, 
Father, in the reach to the community, Heavenly Father, that someone is going to be saved in the kingdom of war, God, through our work. Father, is that it is not in us to do it. Heavenly Father, it is the work of the Holy Spirit. So, Father, I just pray that we would make our calling and election sure. Father, that we're going to love as Christ loved. That is a love that is self-denial and self-sacrificing. So that someone, Heavenly Father, will enter the glory of God, the kingdom of God. So thank you for hearing and answering our prayer. Where we have failed you, we ask that you forgive us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we ask these things. Amen. 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 Amen.